Good afternoon guys, my name is Brandon and today we've got a flux coil welding project to do so stick around. Today we're going to be building a material storage rack. As I said earlier, it's going to be a flux coil welding project and we're going to be working with some recycled metal. There are some challenges when working with recycled metal and we're going to talk about all of it. Let's get going. I used to have a wooden table that I used for welding here and I've replaced it now with this hydraulic lift table. If you want to find out more about that, I'll put a link up above. Because this is a hydraulic adjustable lift table, I have no storage for underneath. So you can, any material that I used to have underneath my old workbench, I can't have it under there anymore. So it's left me kind of just putting material everywhere. So I got a couple full lengths here. Uh, I've got more storage up there and I've got more stuff down here and it goes all the way down to the other end. So we got to build something to organize this. I'm going to come down with a couple legs and then we're going to have a horizontal piece that comes across. We might do, we're going to do at least two of them if not three, but it'll make more sense as we get going. So this is kind of the idea. So here's the wood up here. We're going to come down with a leg and down with a leg. That's going to be metal. It's going to be bolted through here, so we're going to have a couple holes in that uh, metal. And then we're going to have a piece that comes all the way across. That way I can put long pieces of metal like in these areas here without having to thread it down through. If we, if we put the verticals up right here, we'd have to slide the material in the whole way. I don't want to be able to do that. I just want to be able to walk up drop the material on it and be done with it. So that's, that's what we're doing. It'll be a little bit more clear as we get going. Now what I've got here guys is some old bed frames. Now I picked these up for free and typically you can find these for free yourself on the side of the road. You just gotta look for them. But there are some challenges when working with this stuff and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just kinda try to figure out what I got here to work with. So it's showing that they're just under seven feet. So what I'll probably do is make each of these legs three foot long because I have a piece here and here. You have to be real careful uh, when you're working with recycled metal like this because a lot of times what happens is that you end up spending so much time prepping the metal and working with the material to get it to the point where you can actually use it that you've burned up so much labor that you could have just gone out and bought the piece to begin with, not done the prep work, and just be ready to weld it. So you kind of got to weigh that out when you're working with uh, recycled materials. That's a big factor, especially if you're putting it into something that you're going to sell. For here, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm just kind of bored today, so this is what I'm going to do with my time. Now, another thing you're going to want to think about when you're working with metal bed frames is that they're tempered meaning that they don't cut like regular steel cuts, it's hardened. So any tool that you use to cut this, it's going to dull out, it's going to get dull real quick. Use a portable bandsaw to cut through this, but again, because it's hardened metal, it burns out the blades real quick and that gets expensive when you got to do a lot of cuts. Likewise, you wouldn't want to use, this is, you know, this is a hundred dollar plus blade for a carbide tooth dry cut saw. You wouldn't want to burn this up on that because you're definitely not going to be making money there. Another alternative would be to use an abrasive cutoff disc. That would work, but you have a lot of abrasive dust that goes with it. Or you could even use one of these diamond discs, but again, that's going to prematurely wear your diamond disc out because it's hardened metal. But the best tool that I found for cutting scrap metal is a plasma cutter. If you want to know more about this plasma cutter, I'll put a link up above. Now, for you guys who don't know much about what a plasma cutter is, it's basically a tool that cuts metal using electricity and air from a compressed air source. So, this one here is a 50 amp unit. It's dual voltage, 110 or 220. It does its own thing. If you plug it into a dedicated welder outlet, it'll run it on 220. If you plug it into 110, it runs it on that, but it just won't max out. It doesn't go to the full 50 amps. Then you just need a compressed air source and ground your material. Just a ground clamp like you'd have with a welder. I may have to grind this. Uh, I don't know if it's going to get a good connection. Looks like it has some sort of paint on the surface. And then you just turn it on and you're ready to start cutting. And this is fan cooled so as soon as I turn on the switch you can hear the fan start up and it's ready to start using. 
and I've got my air right up around 60 PSI. So the area that does the cutting on this is that little hole right in the center of that. You see that little hole right there? That's, that's where this is actually making the cut. And then I'm just lining up the center of that tip with my line so I can make a nice straight cut. When this starts cutting badly, you need to replace that piece that I just showed you. Those are called consumables and they're very inexpensive for this tool. Now we just gotta make a few more pieces and we're good to go. And one of the great things about a plasma cutter is they're super simple to operate and they re don't require anything other than electricity and air. That's it. There's no flammable bottles of acetylene or oxygen, no hoses, no torches. This is it. That's all you need. So it leaves a nice straight cut, very little slag, and what little slag there is, you can just knock it off on the back with a chip and hammer. There, you can see that requires very little prep work right now. That's pretty good. Like I said, the consumables for this are super cheap. You can pick up a whole pack of them for, I don't know, like under 20 bucks. They're super cheap and you get a whole bunch of them. They last a real long time. I replace the consumables on mine maybe every, I don't know, 50, 60 cuts or so. I, it's not very often that I have to replace them. The minute it just starts not cutting that great, I just replace them. And it takes like literally 10 seconds to do it. Ended up with four pieces rather than three for horizontals, which is okay. And you know, like we talked about last week, order of operations, trying to be the most efficient that you can be. That's what we did. We cut all four of these and then we got to move on to the next process. If you guys want to know how I price out my work and come up with the things that I come up with, put a link up above. You guys can check that out. But see, look here. Now, this is the one I did freehand. And you can see my line, but I'm kind of like, kind of wavy. So again, you know, I might have done it freehand and it, the cut might have gone a little bit faster now, but now I got to go back and try to tune this up, make it look a little bit better and straighter, and I'm going to end up using up more consumables. I'm going to end up using, you know, a grinder wheel. So, you know, sometimes taking a little bit of extra time in the beginning to do a better job saves you on the other end. So what may seem like you're cutting it faster by doing it by hand and not doing a straight edge really you're gonna have to end up, unless you've got a real good steady hand, which my hand isn't all that steady, but um, yeah, so now I gotta go back and fix that a little bit. So Just something to consider, you know? So now we have these, now we gotta do our vertical uprights, our upright pieces that need the holes in them so that we can secure it to the wood uh, joist above. Now here I'm just using the plasma cutter as a gouge. I'm gouging off those rivets that hold on that cross piece. It's real simple to do. I'm gonna make the vertical hanging pieces out of this material here. They're going to be 15 inches long and then I'm just going to burn a hole through it so it can bolt into the wood joist up above. We have four cross pieces and each cross piece is going to have two verticals so we need to make eight of these verticals at 15 inches long so that's what I'm going to work on now. Now for you guys starting out in welding or you're new to it or you're thinking about picking it up or whatnot, I have a playlist beginner welding series that's geared towards all this stuff. It has all kinds of tips on setting up a welder, picking out tools, all kinds of things. And I'll put a link up above for you guys so you guys check it out. Now that we got all our verticals cut, now we've got to prep the area where the weld's going to be. So I'm going to have these verticals roughly 14 inches from the ends, but so I don't have to keep handling these over and over to mark where I need to grind out because this area around here has to be clean so that we can weld this vertical piece to this horizontal piece. So we're going to use a flap disc, but I don't want to go measuring every single piece that's, you know, I'm handling four of these pieces again, marking it here and marking it here. So I'm just going to transfer my marks into that stack over there and I'll show you. So you see how I have my marks here? I'm just going to carry it down now. There, there, there. That'll be close enough. There, there, and there. And that'll tell me where I need to be when I'm grinding. So let's get to grinding now. And with any cutting, grinding, and welding operation, it's always a good idea to wear a mask, eye protection, and ear protection. Eye injuries are very common in a metal shop. I can't count the number of times that I've been to the doctors where they dig out metal out of your eyes. And if you've never had it done, what they do is they use a needle and they stick a needle in your eye and they try to flip the metal out. It's not enjoyable. So spare yourself that and wear your safety glasses.
There, so now that's all laid out. Now what we're going to do is we're going to weld these out, do all four of them just like this. Then after those are all done, now I'm going to plasma a hole in the top. And the reason I'm not doing it now is just because I want to be able to orient these the way they look the best. And if I put a hole in it and I end up turning it, on, I don't want the hole ended up on its side. So that's the reason behind that. So the next thing we're going to do is going to get the welder set up and we're going to start welding these out. All right, so now we got to figure out our material thickness. So that's eighth inch. Uh, that's bigger than 14, so eighth inch there. And we are eighth inch there. So let's go set up our machine. So here's the char inside the door. And we're welding steel. We're using flux coil wire. And we're using 30 thousandths. And we'll come over to here. And eighth inch is right between 3 and 40 and 3 and 45. So it falls somewhere around there. So it's probably going to be right around you know, 3 and 40 and some change. This seems to run pretty uh, consistent to the chart. So 3, and go to 40, and there we are. Fire it up. Let's get to welding. This school is a really dirty process, so even with good ventilation, I still like to use a respirator. So this is a real cheap respirator. It's a 3M brand. If you want to know where I get it, I'll put a link down in the description. It's well worth the money, and it's just good insurance for your lungs, you know? And as we talked about in last week's episode, what I'm doing here is I'm just tacking everything together. We never weld everything together fully until we know that everything is right and everything is the way we want to do it. So I'm going to tack each one of these together until I have all four tacked, and then we'll go back through and we'll weld them all out. I absolutely love this adjustable height pneumatic lift table, but I have a hard time like wanting to weld on top of this surface because it looks so nice. So I still put down my steel plate on top and I weld on top of that and try to keep the majority of my work to that. You know, you don't need a fabrication or fixture table. It's just not necessary. I have never really found any instances that I would need one unless maybe I was doing some production work and I was doing a ton of things that I needed to have. Uh, duplicate repeated over and over. I really never found a need for it. This is all I've ever needed. Matter of fact, the last bench I had, as you guys remember from my regular viewers, was a wooden workbench. This is more than adequate for welding, fabrication, it's adjustable height, and you can use it to service all your equipment. So now with everything tacked together, it's time to fully weld it out. Now I'm just going to let you guys listen for a little while. I'm using here what's called self-shielded flux coil wire, also known as inner shield. Well, they make what they call outer shield, also referred to as dual shield. That is also a flux coil wire, but the flux within it doesn't shield the weld puddle from the atmosphere, so you end up using a gas with it. So that's where you get the dual shield. I have a lot of fans going, so I'm using self-shielded wire because if I didn't, it would blow away all my coverage gas. There. And that's all it really needs for weld. I'm just doing the side. I'm not going to bother to do the bottom or the top. And I'm going to do the side here. And same thing over here. So that'll be plenty. It's only going to have a few hundred pounds of weight on it. So. Then I'm only going to do one, probably just one uh, hole here, and I'll just do a lag bolt. really don't even need... Two. I mean, I, I guess I could do two, but it's not necessary. I, I just don't want to go perforating the, the joist up above any more than I have to. So probably one uh, up top would be plenty because all it is is just shear load. It's not pull out force, it's shear load. So uh, yeah, like I say, it's only going to have a few hundred pounds on it. And you know, a 3 8 lag in the top here, you could easily use this, you know, for a 200 pound guy, do pull ups on it easily. So. Yeah, that'll be plenty. So you get the idea. Now I just got three more of these to do. For most of the welding that I do on this channel, I'm using self-shielded flux coil wire. Rarely, if ever, do I use a dual shield. Dual shields primarily for structural type applications. Just buy yourself a good name brand wire and you'll have great results. In a lot of ways, welding is like painting. You know, the welding aspect of the whole project is really a small portion of it. You know, most of it's all prep work. Just like 
painting is, you know, putting down drop cloths and masking everything off and cutting in. Welding is very similar in that manner that, you know, you're, you're prepping more than you're actually welding. So we've got all four of these welded up now. Now the next thing we have to do is prep. We want to get rid of any sharp edges, round anything off. Remember, this is going to be hanging down. Uh, it's going to be higher than six feet, but, um, you know, it's just a nice added touch to round things off a little bit, uh, smooth things up, just make them look good and get rid of any of this dross that's on here or the slag from, from the uh, cutting process with the plasma. So we got to prep that, but right now let's get some holes punched through with the plasma on all these. Like I said, just going to do one hole. I'm going to figure it for a 3 8 inch lag bolt. So we'll get these burned through and then we can get all our tools put away other than the grinder. Then it's just a matter of grinding and smoothing everything up making it look good and then we'll install them. We were talking about eye injuries earlier and I want to share a funny story with you. So I was in middle school and our teacher tasked us with building some sort of gadget or gizmo. Well I ended up building a book bag that sounded an alarm when you picked it up. And the way it worked was it was a simple circuit using a smoke alarm and a coat hanger that when you pick the bag up the coat hanger would make contact with another piece of metal inside the bag and then trigger the smoke alarm. But a lot of coat hangers have like an epoxy coating on them so to make the circuit work I had to remove the coating so it would have direct metal contact. So I went out in the garage started grinding on the coat hanger. Well sure enough wasn't wearing safety glasses and all the metal from the coat hanger went into my eyes and I ended up having to wear an eye patch. Went to the doctors that day and wore an eye patch the following day to school. Did finish the project uh, but I ended up finishing the project with an eye patch because I had metal all through my eyes. Uh, but the good news is that the project did work and I did get an A on the project. So wear your eye protection. I learned that at an early age. That's all there is to it but we had a little change of plans. So originally I was going to mount those racks above this table so that way I could load material on either side of the table. Well I changed my mind and I put them over here. Not as convenient but I'll explain why. So you can see the lag bolts that I put up through there. There's one on on each side. So yeah. And you can see it over here from that angle as well. Now the reason that I didn't put that over the table is because if I've got a motorcycle on here and it's all the way up, it would be about 48 inches from the bottom of that cross piece to the top of this table. And although that's probably high enough to put a motorcycle on there, I just didn't want uh, something interfering on it, you know, because maybe you want to sit on the motorcycle for a reason when it's on this stand. And then I could just foresee myself stabbing my head into these uh, edges or something like that. So, yeah, so I mounted it over here. It's a little more inconvenient, but it'll work. And you also see I can do like metal over here and I've got some short runs in between here, which makes it kind of nice in this little small section here. And then I've got wood and a little bit of pipe over here. And this piece of pipe holds some small round dowel. So yeah, but uh, another good tip, you can see I rounded off the edges too. So, you know, a couple points when working with metal like this or something that's uh, used or scrap, you gotta factor in the amount of time that you're gonna be working with this stuff because typically, working with used metal or scrap metal, there's more labor involved to it as opposed to just buying something new, prepping it lightly, grinding it, and then using it. But you know, for something like this, works out perfect. You know, I didn't, like I said, I didn't have a whole lot going on today. So I had these bed frames. Just remember, if you're using bed frames, they're super hard, you're gonna go through your consumables. So if you're drilling it, you're gonna go through drill bits. Whatever you're cutting it with, you're gonna go through that material a lot faster than if you're just using regular mild steel for your project. So it can be done, you just gotta use a little forethought, but my opinion, if you're gonna work with bed frames, the best way to do it and the best way to cut it is to actually use a plasma cutter. That way, 
you're not tearing up all your consumables and burning up your blades and all that other stuff. So I want to thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for tuning in. If this is something that you liked, please don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. If you're wondering what I'm working on before it even makes it up to YouTube, you guys can catch me on Facebook and on Instagram. I'll have the links down below. And if you guys are wondering about any of the tools that I'm using, my chop saw, my respirator, any of the other stuff that you saw me use in the plasma cutter, I'll have links for that as well down into the description. Thanks for watching, guys. Until next week, new video every Friday. I'd appreciate a like and subscribe. I'll see you next week. Have a good day. Stay safe. See ya. Come, come, come.